Hi, and welcome to Cryptobiography. I'm your host, Brandon Starr, and we're going to be reading part two of Connections this week. If you have any comments or questions about this episode or previous episodes, cryptobiography at gmail.com, or hit us up on Twitter or Facebook. This is the raw version, which I am recording to put up on YouTube. Then I will take the audio, edit it a bit, clean it up a bit, and put it out as a podcast. Here we go. Connections Part 2 It was early morning when Rourke walked out of the Metropolitan Detention Center. He wanted to talk to his wife, Alma. There was much to tell her, but she was at her work, which was also her passion. She was a curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Her taste in art, and in most things, was far more refined than his. He decided to take a drive to Griffith Observatory. He always felt more relaxed up there amongst the remarkable views and the Art Deco architecture, which always to him felt like a beautiful balance between modern aesthetics and classical designs. He spent a few hours there, much of it looking out over the low hills and long, spreading neighborhoods of Los Angeles. But if someone who knew him had watched him, they would have seen subtle signs of agitation. His hands were dipping into and out of his jacket pockets, and he didn't stay at any one spot for more than a minute or two. This was fall, and the grass around the observatory was just starting to come back from its summer desiccation. Rourke took some time to look at it, then just stared off at the horizon. If it was a mistake, it was a mistake. I can't do anything about it now, he said aloud to no one. No one cared, or even turned to look at him. It's out of my hands, in any event. If he escapes, I will find a way to track him down. And at least he will not have easy access to his wealth. He straightened up and walked down the hill to where his car was parked. It was a Lexus, a few years old, a little dusty, but otherwise in good shape. He drove to the museum, having texted Alma that he was on his way. When he arrived, he paid to park and was waved through the line by the ticket takers who knew him well. He smiled and thanked them. Alma's office was hidden away just off one of the nearest galleries. He knocked and walked in. Hello, love, he said. Alma beamed at him. Glad to see you. Wasn't sure what would happen with you and the wolf this morning. I suspected you might stretch it out, make it take all day. Alma was in her forties, a little short, but in good shape, with slightly wavy, dark hair to her shoulder. Her smile, which came easily, as it did now, lit up her face. I thought that too. Well, I told you as much, but in the end, I think it's best for me to leave him for a day or two, let him think about what I know or suspect about him. He went around her desk to kiss her. Best part of my day, he said. Best part, she agreed. It was an old joke between them that had solidified into a convention. Will Grant be able to hold him? I think so, whether you mean in regard to his legal capability. As to his physical capability, I can't really say. I have contingencies in place to track him down if he escapes. Alma pursed her lips. It's quite a risk you're taking, as you've said many times. But I really do need to know if this is, shall we say, a lone wolf or part of a pack. We've never found a pack before. <laughs> Just a duo, he said, nodding. But it's enough to suggest the possibility. I think we're very lucky that Wolf, so far, seems to be as alone as the others. Too many of them have been murderers, cheats, abusers of every kind. Too many felt that their ability gave them carte blanche in life, and practically speaking, it did. Emma looked at him for a moment. What's for dinner? she asked. Connor laughed. I was getting too serious there. How about I make my pasta primavera? That sounds great, Emma said. It's getting close to lunch. Would you like to join me for a deli sandwich? Of course, Connor said and held out his arm like a gentleman at a formal ball. Alma grinned and took it. At the deli around the corner from the museum, him with his pastrami on rye, she with her sub sandwich, she asked, what is the preferred word for this here? Is it just sub, like they call him at this place? Or is it hoagie or poor boy or hero or grinder? Just sub or submarine, I think, Connor replied. I can't keep track of all the regional names. I want to say hoagies are from Philadelphia. Google's in your pocket, she said. Sometimes I prefer just remembering, he said. Can't give all my memories to a machine, a corporation. She nodded and took a bite. He looked at her intently. When she looked at him, noticing his stare, he grinned. Sorry, can't help myself sometimes. Still? Yep, still and forever, as far as I can tell. Forever's a long time. Don't I know it, Connor replied. He rolled his shoulders, working out some kinks. Some days, the th 
sometimes the days fly by and the years are at a standstill. Then sometimes I feel like I wake up and missed a year or two, or ten. Yeah, it's just how we humans experience time. How we humans do, yes, he grinned at her. She smiled back. Plans for this afternoon, she asked. Beside getting groceries for the Primavera? Mm, do some more research, she said. I won't be able to really relax until the wolf situation is put to bed. Like always, she replied. Yeah. Wish I could let that go, but it doesn't seem to be possible, he said. He shrugged and took a bite of his pastrami. After kissing Galma goodbye at the entrance of the museum, Connor headed in the direction of home. They had a large home partway up the hills near Hollywood. It was expensive, but relatively affordable in its day. That was an extremely expensive house. But before going there, he stopped by a small local grocery store specializing in fresh produce, most of it from Southern California. At this time of year, he was still trying to get the best, freshest produce he could. He got a zucchini, some cherry tomatoes, some carrots, peas, yellow onions, plus some garlic. He had pasta at home. He'd wanted shallots instead of the onions. They were in season, but unfortunately were sold out. He was told more were coming that very night, but since he was making dinner soon, he went with the onion. He drove home. The house was built in the 1920s Art Deco style, like Griffith. Two stories with a lovely multi-pane window looking out of the street, which was which it was separated from by a bit of grassy hill. He pulled into the garage and put the groceries away. He took a walk around the house, looking out every window. Satisfied, he went upstairs to, to his office. He pulled up a bunch of sites that involved a lot of pa password entry. Most of the pages had to do with Wolf, and Wolf's picture and name came up multiple times. Then the pages changed, and other names connected with other dates came up. Pictures of a post-Civil War grave, news articles about the Great Depression, searches on genealogy sites, multiple family trees moving around on the screen. Finally, Rourke closed all the windows and stood up. He went downstairs to the kitchen. He made a lemon zest and butter sauce and cut up some garlic and crushed it for later. Then he cooked the pasta and caramelized the onions. He got out the vegetables and cut them into small pieces. He checked his phone. Alma was on her way home, so he continued. He cooked the pasta and got ready to steam the vegetables. He put the garlic into the lemon zest butter and kept an eye on the pasta. He steamed the vegetables and listened for a car to enter the garage. He heard it when the vegetables were nearly done. He smiled. He poured out much of the water, but didn't use a colander. He needed some starch water. In went the garlic lemon butter, the caramelized onions, and some newly steamed vegetables. He cut the cherry tomatoes in halves and put them in. He took some fresh parmesan from the fridge and added that on top. The bright greens, reds, orange, and yellows smiled up from the pot. Alma came in, and he went over to give her a kiss. Have a good afternoon, he asked. Very good, she said. I may have another lead. Already? Well done. No hurries. You have time to pursue it, and we can go over it in depth once Wolf is put to bed. That's the plan. It's just a lead at this point. Nothing confirmed. He nodded. Let's eat. A short while later, at the dinner table, Alma said, This is fantastic. <laughs> Connor winced through a smile. Thanks. I really would have preferred shallots over the onions. You've always been too hard on yourself. This is delicious, she said, simply. They ate for a while in silence. Then she asked, any other information on Wolf you can use? Any other indications he's with anyone else? No one else, still just him, Connor said. I may have found another place he's hiding assets, though. Another, she said. He's had a lot of success. Too much, he agreed. I think I can finally connect him to a murder. Since 98, I mean. Almost straightened up, a fork and forkful of primavera forgotten halfway to her mouth. No more white-collar crimes? Correct. Who? A private detective. He seems to have been investigating Wolf. On whose behalf? Don't know yet. Did he kill this person himself? Or have someone else do it? He hired someone, I think. I believe I've found a trail. Alma just stared at him. That's big. He just nodded. You know, she said, I was rooting for him. For Wolf. Connor looked at her. Really? She nodded. I knew... I knew he was just another bad one, another rotten branch needing pruning. I knew it from the beginning. Uh, I wish some weren't like him. They have every advantage. Why do so many resort to crime? Connor shook his head. I don't know. I know I'm glad. I'm still glad I found you. Alma smiled. And I'm glad I found you, love. Just wish there was someone else I could open up to sometimes. Connor's smile was a little forced now. You know that's not currently possible. He said carefully. 
I know, she said ruefully. But someday, someday. Maybe we'll find someone who hasn't gone bad. We can teach him or her about how to live without crime as a crutch, how to live life fully and let money take care of itself. His smile was a little sad now, but genuine. I'd like that too. It's so hard finding them that young. All the hints usually come from a string of clues. And I know you're doing a wonderful job at the museum. It was so smart of you to go there. I think finding one who's nouveau riche is probably the, the best chance we have. Connor was silent a moment, took a sip, sip of wine, then continued. I also know you feel the lack of real company more than I do. I would say I'm fortunate being by nature a solitary type. You never were. The people you talk with at the museum no doubt help, but I know you have to be on guard all the time, every moment, with every word you say. And I know you do it well, even though it hurts you. He stopped talking. He was staring into his wine glass. Thank you, love, Alma said. I love you, Connor replied. Solitary or not, I don't know how life would be without you. But that's not why I love you, he corrected. I love your smile, your warm heart, and your clever mind. You're a good man, she replied. And beyond your other wonderful properties, I love you for that. Connor finished his wine. I think it's going to be interesting tomorrow, he said. Back to Wolf? She asked. He nodded. And that's the end of the story for this week. Obviously, more to come. Quite a bit more, actually. This is turning... This is going from, like, short story to novella, you know, and possibly beyond in a big ha in a big hot hurry. So uh, we'll have more of Connections next week. Again, still a, still a title in progress. Maybe I'll find something that I like better. Uh, as you can tell, though, there's, like, like the other stories that I've been doing, you know, there's something unusual in the background that's going on that doesn't get revealed right away. And uh, in this case, though, you know, obviously it's multi multi-week, so it still hasn't been re uh, revealed, really. Although, of course, tons of hints because everything, you know, everything is happening. And I'm, I'm enjoying this, uh, this, this process. Uh, that's one reason why the, um, like, the point of view is the way it is. Like, it's a third-person point of view, but it's, uh, it's not the kind that can, like, dive into people's minds, and because that would, like, reveal too much too soon, I feel, at this point. So I've been going from the beginning with like a very a little slightly standoffish third person perspective. So I'm having a lot of fun writing it. Looking forward to uh, writing more this week for next uh, episode. If you have any comments or questions, cryptobiography at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter or Facebook. And of course, we always uh, appreciate a review on iTunes as well. Thank you for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week. Words and Music, Copyright Cryptobiography, LLC, 2018, All Rights Reserved.